All right, today we continue in uh, this series, Endgame. Uh, obviously, it's, we've been talking about the return of Christ and kind of end times. And once again, if this is your first time here, you might be like, what? What did I walk in on? Um, yeah, there's this thing called the return of Christ. Like Christ came once, but there's five times the number of prophecies about his second coming in comparison to his first. In fact, there, there's so many passages of scripture. It's why I have a hard time narrowing it down to just a handful of weeks to talk about um, his return because there's so many little different aspects that we see all throughout uh, scripture. But it, I picture a little bit like this. It's like, like, are you aware, I'm sure you are, summer is gone, right? Like, it just happened this week. All of a sudden, two days ago, it went from 70, and now it's like there's not a 70-degree day in the 10-day forecast, and you're like, oh, you know? It just, like, like, happens. But here's the deal. We all knew it was going to happen, right? You're just like, but when all of a sudden that reality sets in, you're like, man, just didn't see it coming, (laughs) right? It's a little bit of how I feel. Like, I I, kind of, we know it's happening. I think that's how, in many ways, the return of Christ is going to be, is that we're like, there's all these things that he actually said, look for this, look for this, look for this, and yet when it comes, I think we're going to be like, man, didn't see that thing coming at all, and yet we totally did, but it's just like, it'll be pretty shocking when all of a sudden it's it's upon us. Uh, We've obviously, we were talking about the return of Christ, and here's my big question that I want to dive into today is what is God's heart for us, for the church, during end times? Uh, And if you're sitting here today going, whoa, 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 I'm just checking this thing called church out. Like, don't lump me in there. Okay, great. What is God's heart for you, who may not even claim to be a Christ follower or a believer in Jesus? What's God's heart for you during end days? Because are you aware, God actually spoke very specifically to that with a very specific plan for your life, during end times, okay? And so I want to kind of address that for, for the church and for those who wouldn't consider themselves a part of being a follower of Jesus. What's God's heart for us during these days? And so we're going to go back into Matthew chapter 24 because Matthew 24, we looked at it two weeks ago. It's a whole bunch of kind of a list of things that Jesus says these are going to be signs of nearing the end. He likens, likens them to birth pains, and I talked about birth pains. The, the way that we know that a, an arrival is near is they, uh, they grow in intensity and frequency, and then he lists a whole bunch of things. There will be wars, rumors of wars, earthquakes, famines, uh, deception, uh, confusion, all these different things that will be happening that will just kind of amp up. And, uh, and so, That's where we're going to be kind of continuing. And and this is the question, though, that Jesus is tackling in Matthew 24. It's at the very beginning. Let me just read it quick. The disciples asked him, when is all this going to happen? What will be the sign of your coming and the end of the age? And then he goes on to talk about all these birth pains. And here's the signs of the end of the age. Okay? So, But then... He's going to make a statement, and this is a very important statement. So a couple weeks ago, we we covered a whole bunch of verses on the first, kind of the first half of Matthew uh, 24. Now I'm going to hop all the way to verse 36, because this is an important verse that all of us just have to go, okay, that's true. And it's this, about the day or the hour, no one knows, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. Listen, in terms of when will Christ return, I don't know, (laughs) and neither do you. In fact, anyone who's like, I know when he's returning, no, they don't. (laughs) Jesus is like, I don't know. I willingly, like, set aside that knowledge, and I'm allowing only my Father to know that. I mean, literally, anyone who's trying to predict, I mean, here's the deal. Maybe you remember back in like 1988, there was a guy who wrote a book, 88 Reasons Why Christ Will Return in 88, you know, and then 88 came and went, and he's like, oh, I forgot to carry the one, and so it's 89, you know. Uh, uh, people are trying to do this all the time, and, and I, I don't know, and, and this is funny, because last week when I got... Uh, home, my kids are like, dad, we got all of our friends are texting us right now saying you're like preaching like the end of the world is happening right now. And I was like, I didn't say that. I'm just reading scripture and looking at statistics. Like, and yes, there's a lot of statistics that seem to lend itself to go, I think we're nearing the end, but I'm not predicting any dates. Okay. So if you're like, Josh, just give me a date. I'm not going to. Okay. Uh, 
Could I see Christ returning in the next 10 years? Yeah. Maybe a whole lot earlier, perhaps. Maybe later. Not giving you a date, okay? Because I don't know. That's what it tells me. Okay, so now Jesus, though, is going to lean into the attitude of people even in the last days. Okay, so he says this in, in verse 37. As it was in the days of Noah, so it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. For in the days before the flood, people were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage up until the day Noah entered the ark. What's the point? The point is, no matter how crazy things get, even in light of what Jesus said are going to be all these signs of the end, which was a lot of crazy things that will be happening. And some of us could make the argument there's a lot of crazy things happening in the world. He, he said, in light of all that, you want to know what, what will be happening? Life as normal. People are going to go about their lives like life is normal. So then check it out. Knows what he says next in verse 39. They knew nothing about what would happen until the flood came and took them all away. This is how it will be at the coming of the Son of Man, or when Christ returns. Two will be in the field, and one will be taken, and the other left. Two women will be grinding uh, with a handmill. One will be taken, and the other left. The point is, this, this is a picture, just like at the flood, where all of a sudden Noah was taken, and people were taken away. This is a sifting. It's a separating moment between the followers of Christ and those who are not followers of Christ. And it will be just like that. Just like the flood came. It'll be in a moment. So now Jesus is going to say, it's going to happen quickly, folks. So now he's going to try to do a little attitude adjustment upon his followers, upon the listeners. Okay? So he says this in verse 42. Therefore, keep watch. Because you do not know on what day your Lord will come. But understand this. If the owner of the house had known at what time of night the thief was coming, he would have kept watch and would not have let his house be broken into. I think there's one more, right? Or is that? Yeah. So you must also be ready because the Son of Man will come at an hour when you do not expect him. Now, I just have to say this about this set of verses. It, this is one of the funniest little illustrations Jesus gives because he talks about a robber breaking into a home and in the illustration he's the robber which I don't know if that's funny to anyone else but it is to me that Jesus would do this but here here's the deal I don't think Jesus gets worked up over the character that he plays in his little illustration because that's not the point of the story the point of his illustration is he said listen if you knew when he was coming you would be ready in fact in those three verses he says it three times be ready be watchful, be ready. Like that's his point. That's the punchline of what he's saying. He's saying the biggest thing that I want my, my children, my people to be aware of is I want us to all be ready. Years ago, uh, before my kids could drive, my wife and I, we had to go through quite, uh, I don't know, a, some crazy stuff just to get everyone here to church on a Sunday morning. This is like way back when we were in the small auditorium over there. And uh, we had so many services because we were just, uh, we were growing quickly. And so we had like an 8 o'clock service and a 9.15 and a 10.45 and stuff like that. It was, it was a lot. And so Lisa and I would always come to church really early in the morning, like 6 a.m. And we'd leave our kids at home. And then in between the 8 o'clock service and the 9.15 service, that was a tight window, my wife would usually hop in our van, drive home to pick up the kids. And then our kids, they had to be ready. Like they had to, because there's no spare time here. And so she would literally drive in the driveway, and all the kids would be waiting in a line right outside, and they all just hop in. Boop, 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 just like right into the van and hop right in. In fact, some of our neighbors sometimes made comments. They're like, I love looking at your kids just waiting out there for you guys to come home. And then they pop, 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 right on in. But here's what, and then she would, she would turn around just like, I mean, in the driveway, out of the driveway, come straight back here. A lot of times just park the car and run in and leave the kids. And like, you're on your own, check yourselves in, you know, and then, and then run sometimes right up the aisle onto stage to start the next service. And, um, and, and that's what we did for years. Thank goodness now some of them can drive. But back then, what I knew is that there were, this is reality, there's one or two kids that make that possible. One or two that got everyone else ready. 
right? It's just, it's just the reality. You got a couple that are like, I'm staying on top of it, making sure that everyone is ready. Because if I were to put, it in, put that responsibility in charge of, I'm not going to name any kids, <laughs> but some of them, everyone would be asleep and in bed, right? And so there's like, there's some that you're like, you're in charge, you better get everyone ready. And they do, they get everyone ready. And I, I was thinking about, you know, I've had some people go, hold on, didn't we just do a series about end times a few years ago? Why are we coming back to this? And I was like, I, I don't know. I just, I, I feel like someone needs to be making sure that everyone's ready. So, so I'm just trying to, and, and I don't think I'm missing the point here because Jesus says, hey, be watchful, be ready, be ready, be watchful, be ready. Be, and then he's going to tell a whole bunch of parables in chapter 25, actually, that reinforce be ready, be ready, be ready, be ready. I just think we're supposed to be ready. It's just my take, okay? And so I just want to make sure that we're not sleeping during what I think can be some of the most exciting days for the church, And so now, he's going to, after making this statement about being ready, he's going to, in the very next verse, describe what the ready followers look like, okay? If you want to know, am I ready? Let me tell you, he's going to describe what the followers look like are ready. In fact, he's going to call us up to two things, to basically say, I'm going to call you up to two things, and I'm going to warn you away from two things, Like two things that we need to be called up to, two things that we need to be warned away from, okay? And so very next verse, he says this. Who then is the faithful and wise servant? These are the two things that he's going to call us as his servants up to, to be faithful and to be wise. That's the ready follower of Christ will be faithful and will be wise. So I just want, let's just look at those two words for a moment here. When I think about faithful, I think about the application of faithfulness, especially in relationship to a relationship with God. Throughout scripture, he likens our relationship to, to a marriage. I really leaned into that on week one of this series. And when you consider our relationship with Christ like that, it's easy to ask a more kind of honest question of, am I living faithfully to this relationship? Or am I cheating on the relationship? Am I neglecting the relationship? I saw a quote this past week from Tony Evans. He's the pastor of a large church. And he said this. He said, you don't have to go to church every week, but you tell me, how would your marriage be if you didn't go home every night? Like, I think all of us would be like, yeah, that wouldn't be healthy for it. And, and right. And, and not that church attendance is the thing that makes or breaks a relationship, because that's not what it's about. It's, it's not about attendance. It's all about relationship. It's all about, are you pressing into the things that help your relationship with God grow? Which we know church attendance is part of that. It always is. The gathering of the believers is always a part of growth in our walk with God. As well as being in community, smaller communities like groups and serving and using our gifts. Those are always important parts of it. But it's all about this relationship. And God doesn't want anything to get in the way of us having a faithful relationship with him. In fact, think about the the Ten Commandments. The very first of the Ten Commandments is this. You shall have no other gods before me. Meaning, I don't want anything to come between yours and my relationship. Second commandment, you shall not fashion for yourself anything that, and bow down to it. What's he talking about? Idols. Anything that, once again, would, that would come between our relationship, a worship of anything other than, than me. He's all about faithfulness in this relationship. Now, I know some of you are like, listen, I don't have any idols in my house. I'm not bowing down to anything else. And I'm like, oh, are you not? Here's, here's the question I ask myself around the area of, do I have, is, is this an idol in my life? Is it something that is breaking my relationship with him in terms of being faithful? Here's the question. Do I have to check with it before I can obey him? That's how I know it's an idol. Like, like for example, your, your money might be an idol if the Lord calls you to give something, maybe to the church or to an organization or to a missionary or something like that, but you have to check with your bank account first. It might be an idol if. It, it might be, uh, your hobby might be an idol 
if you have to check with it before you can do the thing the Lord is calling you to do or give of your time or your talent in a certain area and you're like, I gotta check with that first. If your relationships, even relationships are good, but a relationship can be an idol if you have to check with it before you can be obedient to him. Your addiction, it might be an idol if you have to check with it before you can be obedient to him. Your job could be an idol if you have to check with it before you can be obedient to him. But Christ is calling us as a church, to be faithful. Nothing between our relationship and him. Then he says this. So be faithful and, do you remember the second word? Wise. Be wise. Here's how I process the idea of wisdom. I think um, one of the greatest traits of wisdom is this. It sees beyond the moment. The person who is wise doesn't make the decision based on today, or doesn't make the decision today on this their decision today on this immediate moment. They make today's decision around tomorrow's outcomes. Let me say it again. They make today's decisions around tomorrow's outcomes, a.k.a. they don't drink the night away today because they know the impact on tomorrow. They don't lie and cheat today because they know that it will create a broken trust in tomorrow or for tomorrow. They don't give into temptation tonight or today and live in regret tomorrow. They don't spend spontaneously today because they're strategically saving for tomorrow. They don't spew out all over social media today and lose all relational credibility tomorrow. That's a good word right there. They don't explode in anger in a fight today, but they hold their tongue so they can speak in grace and truth in a conversation Tomorrow, they make today's decisions based on tomorrow's outcomes. And Jesus is calling us to be wise. Isn't it interesting? He says, he's looking for the faithful and wise servants. And I just wonder, man, what could the church look like if we were all faithful in our walk with him and wise? I, I think there would be something about the people of God that would be so peculiar that people would be actually drawn to it. Faithful and wise. And then he immediately in the passage, he's going to, now, well, let's go back to it. He's going to unpack some things about this servant, okay? So let's go to it. Who then is the faithful and wise servant whom the master has put in charge of the servants in his house sold to give them food at the proper time? Okay, so in this little story illustration, the servant is in charge of feeding the other servants, okay? It will be good for the servant whose master finds him doing so when he returns. Truly, I tell you, he will put him in charge of all of his possessions. This goes in line with the stories that Jesus tells and the parables Jesus tells over and over and over again, which is, hey, if you're faithful with little, he'll make you faithful with much. Okay, so right in line with that, very next verse, he says this. But suppose the servant is wicked and says to himself, my master is staying away a long way. Check this out, because this is interesting. Remember, this is all in the whole context of Christ's return, and he's saying, suppose the servant is wicked. Why? Because they've gotten lazy in waiting, because they're like, where's Jesus? When's he returning? It seems like he's been away a long time. Isn't that interesting? He's saying, hey, it's sometimes what can happen is in the waiting, we can become apathetic to being diligent and purposeful to be watchful and alert and paying attention and we fall into wickedness. So continue on here. He says, and he, here's what happens. Here's the two warnings that he's going to lean into in terms of what the servant starts to do. He, the wicked things are, he begins to beat his fellow servants and to eat and drink with drunkards. The master of that servant will come on a day when he does not expect him and at an hour uh, he's not aware of and he will cut him to pieces and assign him to a place with the hypocrites where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. And that is just in line with Jesus' language kind of throughout the Gospels that this person is someone who might have said, hey, I'm a Christian, right? And he's actually going, get away from me, I never knew you. You might have been associated with me by name, but we didn't have this thing called relationship. You might have been throwing out the Christian like cards a lot, going, hey, I'm going to church. Hey, me and Jesus, we're pretty cool. And he's like, oh, but we don't even know each other for this person. 
But he's going to, I want to kind of go back now to these two things that he says, hey, beware, Christians, beware, church, that you don't fall into these things. Because I think it's really interesting that of all these things, this is kind of like the great crescendo at the end of Jesus' dialogue here around his return. And here's the two things that he's warning the servants, the Christians, about not falling into. And notice what they are. The first one is to uh, beat his fellow servants. What is that? Okay, so if the servant is the Christian, to beat the fellow servants is to mistreat or to poorly treat other Christians. Isn't that interesting? That one of the biggest warnings Jesus is warning the church from is turning on each other. And yet, this is something that it's almost, it's, it's so common and it's painful that it's common That we treat each other sometimes so poorly. And let me tell you the why we treat each other poorly. Because we assume that if they're a Christian, they should do it all right. But, But we don't. We're still imperfect people making imperfect decisions, making bad decisions, sometimes purposefully, sometimes not purposefully. And we lack grace for one another in our mistakes. And we, of all people, should be the ones that we know that we need grace because we're people of mistakes. Right? We, like we are people who have experienced the greatest grace upon our lives and we need to extend it not only to the world but to one another. Am I preaching to anyone here today? <laughs> I, I think the way that we fight this from turning on each other, ter- treating each other poorly is by overextending grace. We have to be a people who just are, it's like grace drips off of our tongues, off of our lips. And maybe that's a good question just to ask yourself. Are my my words dripping with grace? Now, it doesn't mean that you can never disagree with someone because you'd be like, hold on, does that just mean we, we gotta try to pretend to get along and I disagree with them? No, it doesn't mean you can't disagree with someone or, or can't oppose someone, yet you can still do that with grace dripping off your lips. Here's what I mean by that. I love maple syrup. Like, I love it. Not the fake stuff, not the corn syrupy stuff that some people put on pancakes, real stuff. Real maple syrup, it's just the best. In fact, I like maple on pretty much anything. It's like donuts, maple frosted, you know? Uh, On my steak, I actually have this maple seasoning that I put on top. On my burgers, maple. Pierce's Farmstead has a maple mustard. Go buy them up, okay? I buy, I literally, at the end of the season, I usually buy a dozen jars because it's got to make it all the way till next July for me. And so, but it's, ma- oh, maple's just so good. I just love maple on just pretty much anything. It's just my thing. In fact, I really hate Brussels sprouts, but you put maple syrup on that, I'll eat it <laughs> happily. And the reason why I say that is because you season something that I hate well, I'll still digest it. We need to be people who can speak something to someone else that you're like, this is really hard for me to hear, yet there's such grace on our lips that I can digest it. There's such grace in our words that we're like, although I know this is difficult, it came very sweetly delivered to me. That needs to be the thing that just pours out of us is this thing called grace. The second thing that he leans into, oh man, I, Yeah, I should read this. How much time do I have? No time. Okay, I'm going to skip Ephesians, okay? For everyone in the back who's running my slides, I'm going to skip Ephesians. I'm just going to go right to uh, his next thing that he says. Because then he says, eating and drinking with drunkards. Eating and drinking, eating and drinking with drunkards. Okay, the drunkards are already doing what is wicked. Eating and drinking with them is for you to slide into their behavior with them. The church, we have to be a people that go, we're not okay with actually sliding into sin. We cannot be a people who go, let's see how close. I mean, this was like classic high school ministry. All the kids in my youth ministry. Hey, so how far can we go before we're sinning? No, 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 no. The question is not how close can we get before we're at sin. It's I don't want this to be a part of my lifestyle. We, we We steer clear 
of it. It's that we become so passionate about making sure that the evil that has crept into our hearts and in our homes, we're going, that, is, that has to get out. Because he says, listen, this is the warning for the church, is that we don't turn on each other and we don't allow ourselves to slide into sin. He's looking for faithfulness, he's looking for wisdom, and he's looking us, for us to steer clear on turning on each other and allowing sin to creep into our lives. So now, let me just finally end with this. For the person who's like, what does this mean for me as the non-believer? Guess what? God has a very specific heart for the person who doesn't yet know him in the end times. Check it out. In 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9. This whole chapter, by the way, all of 2 Peter chapter 3 is all about the return of Christ. It's all about the end. And he says this, the Lord is not slow in keeping his promise as some understand slowness. Because people are like, hold on, seems like Christ isn't returning. It seems like he's really slow. And he goes, he's not slow. You want to know what he is? Instead, he is patient. He's not slow. He's patient. What's he patiently waiting for? He's patiently waiting for you. The person who has not yet put their faith in you, in him, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. His heart is actually for the person who doesn't yet know him. He goes, it's not that I'm slow in coming. I am purposely, patiently waiting because I'm longing for you. I, I picture it a little bit like this. My, this last uh, Thursday, I got home from uh, after work, and I was expecting to see four kids at home out of uh, all of our kids. That's who I was expecting to see. And apparently, like, one came home, and she's like, oh, I got a game. And I, we didn't know. Okay, so she's off to a game. Uh, another one's like, oh, you just got called into work. Okay, so now he's off to work. Another one just like, hey, I, I got a call uh, a play date. Can I go on over to this friend's house? Okay, so now he's gone. And so then all of a sudden, where we thought we were going to have a bunch of kids, it's my Eden, my little Eden. She's 10 years old, and she's standing there, and she's like, when it hit her, and she realized she was alone, she's like, huh. She did this. She's like, who am I going to play with? I was like, your Barbies? (laughs) The neighborhood kids? I don't know. And she starts, and she walks into our side room, and she starts to cry. And my heart immediately went out to her and for her, because I felt, I was like, oh, she just feels so left out. And my heart hurts that she feels left out. And this is why God is patient, because he goes, I don't want anyone to be left out. I'm just, I'm just waiting, because I just, I want to make sure that no one's left out. That everyone has a chance to say yes to me. Why don't you stand with me and I'll close this here in prayer. Why don't you bow your heads with me. If today you are the person who said, hey, I wouldn't have called myself a Christian. Maybe today is the day that that changes because God's heart is for you. It's not that he's slow in his return. He's patient. And his heart is actually for you that none would perish. No, not one. That all everyone would come to repentance. And repentance is simply turning from our sin and putting our faith in what Jesus did for us at the cross. And maybe you just want to make that decision right now. It can be through a simple prayer. I'm just going to pray it right now. You just can pray along with me in your heart. Um, if you want to make that decision today, it can sound like this. Heavenly Father, I admit I'm a sinner. And I've been trying my whole life to deal with my sin on my own. <laughs> come to find out I can't. There's nothing I could do. And Jesus knew that. So he came. And it's what he could do. And so I put my faith in Jesus and what he did at the cross. He paid for my sins with his death. I put my faith in him. I ask that you place your Holy Spirit in me. Help me to walk with you. As we continue praying, I just pray for all of us who would call ourselves Christ followers. Lord, I pray that it would be true of us that we would be the faithful ones, that we would be the wise ones, that we would be ones who don't turn on one another and don't slide into sin. May we be ready and watchful and waiting, but doing it diligently. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. If we can pray with you, for you in any way, our prayer partners will be right down here along the front. Um, They're available online as well. 
As you give, if you want to give, you can give in the back and boxes or online. We'll see you guys next week.